Seamus, Thomas Hardy. Um, I think I'm right in saying that Philip Larkin, when talking about poets, who was a tremendous, uh, tremendously keen on Hardy, said that while he hugely admired Yeats, and I think he talked to sort of Dylan Thomas and others, the poet that he really loved was Thomas Hardy. Yes, that's right. Why, why was that? Uh, he says um, that the, uh, uh, the importance of Hardy to him was that he didn't have to jack himself out of his own life mm. to write poetry. Uh, and he compares them explicitly with Eliot and with Yeats, and he says, unlike them, Hardy's not a transcendental writer. He's a writer of, of, of a writer on, on, on the on the scale of the everyday. Um, his subjects, Larkin says, are time and the passing of time, love and the passing of love. Um, so Very I think well it's, it's 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 the human proportions of <coughs> of Hardy's voice. I think that Larkin responded to. Yes, so the, the kind of experience he, he writes about are the kind of experiences which even if we haven't had, we can all imagine having it. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, because Hardy was also a novelist, uh, I think you can often see in his uh, lyrics um, an, an interest in uh, narrative and in uh, the consequences that narrative involves that also sh shape a Larkin poem. Uh, these, these are, these are um, little um, broken stubs of human stories that get caught up in his lyrics. Yes. You've chosen a poem to read today uh, by him, the, the Voice, and let's, why don't you read that and then let's talk about that. Woman much missed how you call to me, call to me, saying that now you are not as you were when you had changed from the one who was all to me, but as at first when our day was fair. Can it be you that I hear? Let me view you then standing as when I drew near to the town where you would wait for me, yes, as I knew you then, even to the original air-blue gown. Or is it only the breeze in its listlessness travelling across the wet mead to me here, you being ever dissolved to one wistlessness, heard no more again far or near? Thus I, faltering forward, leaves around me falling, Wind oozing thin through the th thorn from Norwood and the woman calling. I think I'm right in saying that this poem was one of those which came after the death of his wife, his first wife, Emma. Um, and that's when he went into this extraordinary phase of poetry writing. Mm -hmm. am, am I right about that? Yes. Um, his first wife, from whom he has become estranged, they continue to live in the same house, but but strangers to one another uh, for reasons that biographers still speculate about. Uh, his, his wife dies and uh, provokes in Hardy a whole group of intensely felt poems of, of remorse and guilt, but also of extraordinarily vivid recollection of their time together, of which this is a which super this example. Is, this is one. So what, what makes this poem so effective? Um, well, I think there's a clue in the title. Um, uh, if you call your poem The Voice, then you are encouraging your readers to think about the ways in which they are going to voice the poem. Um, and the poem begins by setting up um, an insistent, unusual in English uh, poetry m meter, um, dum diddy dum diddy, which in classical prosody is called a dactyl, but that doesn't really make much difference. Uh, and, and that's set up as, as, as it were, the, 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 the basic form of the poem as he, as he recollects his meetings with Emma um, and, and wondering whether what he's hearing in the breeze is indeed her voice, while all the time knowing, of course, that it's not her voice. It's entirely his imagination of her voice. But the stroke of genius of the poem is the fourth verse, which then breaks that pattern altogether um, and, and presents um, in its metre uh, a brilliant enactment of his own faltering. Thus I, faltering forward, leaves around me falling, wind oozing thin through the thorn from norward and the woman calling. Uh, very hard to know how to scan that last line. It seems to float free from the poem into a piece of human speech. Uh, it's that verse done. which just makes the poem such a great poem because it's, it's so unexpected. Poem. Absolutely unexpected, and and it's in a way about the uh, the metrical expectations that the first three verses have very beautifully established, suddenly being frustrated. It's a, the poem falls to pieces in a in an entirely 
beautifully uh, artful way. And it's a poem, of course, about Hardy, in a way, falling to pieces. It's its, it's most beautifully contrived effect. So you're actually seeing the man in his mental state well, in a way the, that... The, the poem falters, and, 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 and the faltering is not only communicated on the level of, of the meaning of the words, but also in the level of the, of, of the rhythm of the poem. I mean, it's done absolutely brilliantly, I think. Is this poem typical of Hardy, do you think? I mean, the, the way he does that, the way he creates these unexpected effects, the simplicity of it, all of these elements, do, do this, does that make it a typical Hardy poem? Yes, I think it absolutely does. And, 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 um, and it's a typical Hardy poem in other, in other ways as well, such as the, the, uh, it has at its heart a, a, a vivid re recollection, which we can place in, into a, an implied narrative. So um, uh, Emma waiting for him as he came near to the town, as he says, um, for a lover's meeting with her. And the astonishingly powerful, clear detail of her original air blue gown. So he remembers the dress that she was wearing. Um, very beautiful touch in an, in an entirely um, subtle way, sort of bringing in the thought of something kind of ethereal, like an, like an angel almost, um, but at the same time keeping it uh, absolutely um, in, in the realms of, of um, ordinary sorts of experience. It's also a completely typical Hardy poem in that it's fascinated by the idea of haunting. Um, um, someone once asked Coleridge if he believed in ghosts, and Coleridge said he didn't believe in ghosts, he'd seen too many of them. Uh, and Hardy he sees ghosts all the time. And of course, they're all ghosts of the imagination. They're ghosts of uh, the ghosts of the subjective life. They're, they're, they're not objectively there. And this is a fantastic example of, of Hardy being haunted by a voice uh, that he knows is only a voice inside his inside his mind. And I think that the way that the the way that the verse um, uh, captures his sense of um, neediness, wanting to hear her, listening out for her. Um, while at the same time knowing that she's really not there, um, not there to respond to his questions, is, is, is very beautifully done, very poignantly done. And this whole notion of the, the passing of time, which yeah. he was always so conscious of, I look into the glass and view my wasting skin. Yes, all that's that. right. I mean, he wrote that when he wasn't that old, but he, yes. he must have, can't have known that he was going to live for another 30 years, but he was very much conscious of it always, wasn't he? And presumably after the death of his wife, again, this feeling that he could never go back and... Yes. Do what he should have done. Behave that's as he should I, that's have absolutely done. right. And again, it's lines of Larkin that come to mind. Those wonderful lines that Larkin says, "Truly, though our element is time, we are not suited to the long perspectives open at each moment of our lives. They link us to our losses." And so he goes on. But that idea of being, of, of being perennially caught in long perspectives of memory, uh, simply because you are uh, a human being and therefore um, uh, um, a, a creature of time and the passing of time. That's something that Larkin's learned absolutely from Hardy. Yeah. Do you feel as Larkin does about Hardy yourself? I mean, what sh how, how do you feel about his poems compared to others? Uh, he, he, he is um, uh, a tremendous poet, a poet of, 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 of ter terrific um, diversity, actually. There's over a, a thousand poems in the collected poems, and you can roam around in them. Uh, for years and years and continue to surprise yourself by coming a, a, a across one that you hadn't remembered. Um, uh, and also a, poem, a poet of great uh, influence, I think, uh, not just on Larkin, but, but other later, later poets of the 20th century, particularly W. H. Auden, who learned from him this ability to uh, craft uh, tr uh, beautiful lyrics that contain within them a kind of concealed human narrative that sustains your interest in the way that a short story would. They're like sh sung short stories in a way which is very un unusual. And of course, people always say how poetic his novels are, mm. but in a way you're saying that his poems are also, in a sense, quite novelistic. Yes, I think that's right. I think it was Lytton Strachey who said that across every, every poem he wrote uh, falls the shadow of the novelist that he was. I mean, there's, there's a, a sense in which the, um, um, his tremendous metrical and, and, and lyrical ex experimentation is always tied up with um, a sense of... Uh, um, the way that human beings uh, lead their lives in odd little consequential or inconsequential episodes.